Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Welcome everyone to the Functional Medicine Discussion Group meeting tonight. And we're very happy to be joined by one of our favorite speakers, esteemed integrative immunologist, Dr. Aristo Vashtani, who will be telling us how to identify immune system imbalances that are common in autoimmune diseases and hopefully give us some suggestions about how to address them. I'm Dr. Ben Weitz, and I'll start by making some introductory remarks before introducing our sponsor for this evening, which is Integrative Therapeutics, and then I'll introduce our speaker for this evening. I encourage each of you to participate and ask questions by typing in your question in the chat box, and then I'll either call on you or simply ask Dr. Voshtani your question when it's appropriate. Uh, and so um, I hope that you'll consider joining some of our future functional medicine discussion group monthly meetings. We usually meet on the fourth Thursday of the month at 630 Pacific Standard Time. And I guess we'll continue meeting through Zoom for the foreseeable future. Hopefully we'll have in-person meetings at some time uh, soon. Um uh, some of our upcoming meetings are February 24th. We have Dr. Howard Elkin, and he'll be speaking on integrative cardiology. March 24th, Dr. Julie Greenberg will be speaking about integrative dermatology. Uh, April 28th, Dr. Paul Anderson will be speaking about an integrative approach to treating cancer. And May 26th, uh, we have functional maternity with Dr. Sarah Thompson. And if you're not aware, we have a closed Facebook page, the Functional Medicine Discussion Group of Santa Monica, that you should join so we, should, so we can continue the conversation when this evening is over. Um, and I'm also recording this event, and I will include it in my weekly Rational Wellness podcast, which you can subscribe to on um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. And if you enjoy listening to my Rational Wellness Podcast, I would appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts and give me a five-star ratings and review. We have many excellent interviews with many of the top doctors in the functional medicine world. Now I'd like to invite Steve Schneider from Integrative Therapeutics, our sponsor for this evening, to Give us a little information about some of the integrative therapeutic products, which is one of the few professional brands of products that we carry in our office. Steve? Hello, everyone. Um, I, I actually had a couple slides, too, but I'll just not do it because I don't want to complicate stuff. Um, but Dr. Wasserman was asking about some immune stuff for COVID, um, and that's kind of what I was going to show you guys. Um we have a few just um, pretty unique things for immune function that that are super popular for us. And the biggest one is called V-Clear. It, it used to be called ViraClear. We're not allowed to say virus anymore. So um, that sort of gives you an idea of what it's about. It, it is a, an extract or pelargonium sodoides that's grown and um, produced in our by our uh, parent company in Germany. And because it's marketed as a supplement in Germany, it requires a lot of clinical to, to actually launch to, it. To actually launch it. So, so we have about 25 clinical studies on this product, over 10,000 patients, over 3,000 kids um, in all kinds of upper respiratory tract infections, including coronavirus before the pandemic. Um, there's actually a study going on right now with the, the original coronavirus from the pandemic. It's not done yet, but it looks pretty good. And basically the bottom line of all of these studies is shorter duration of episode and um, severity, reduced severity of symptoms. Um, we, the way it's marketed is 
to be taken at the first sign of symptoms. So Dr. Wasserman, if you want some, I can send you some to try, um, but we should do it fast. Uh, <clears throat> but the reality is it can be taken preventatively. It works really well for that. It's just not super practical the way that it's packaged. Um, but in full disclosure, I've been taking it for about two years. Um, it has multi-mechanisms. It, it has a, it inhibits viral implantation on the cell wall. It improves ciliary activity. It has a virucidal um, action of its own. There's, there's actually a study showing uh, better efficacy than amoxicillin in sinusitis. So it, it's the real deal. Um, it's something that we, we literally can't make enough of. Um, so if anybody has any any questions about it or would like to try it, um, you, my email is steve.snyder at integrativepro.com. Um, the other one I really wanted to mention real fast is, is our sort of the integrative version of quercetin. It's called alpha glycosal isoquercetin. It's about 18 times more bioavailable than regular quercetin. So one of our 33 milligram capsules is equivalent to about 500 milligrams of the other brands on the market. Um, it's been a huge, like literally can't make it fast enough. Everybody wants that and zinc because the course that it helps get zinc into the cells and zinc is every, you know, there was a point where you couldn't get zinc anywhere. Um, the, the, the AGI we call it cause it's hard to say is another thing that's, that's been super popular for us over the last two years Typically, people think of it as part of an allergy regimen or anti-allergy regimen, and we sell it for that. But over the last two and a half years, the immune um, aspect of it has, has become a major point. And then we have a zinc, a, a standalone zinc chelate. It's 30 milligram capsules, 100 caps in a bottle, and it's nine bucks retail. So it's, it's, there's nothing as inexpensive as that out there. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much it for right now. So again, if you have any questions, email me and we'll, we'll set you up. Great. Thanks, Steve. And, and somebody asked if you could type your email into the chat box. I can try. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, let me introduce our speaker for tonight is Dr. Risto Vashtani, the father of functional immunology. And he's dedicated his life to helping us to better understand some of the root causes of autoimmune diseases, as well as how to treat them. And many of the tests he has developed for Cyrex labs are focused on this, including his newest test, the lymphocyte map test. Since we are speaking about autoimmune diseases, I just wanted to mention uh, the shocking news report from a new paper that was just published today in the British Medical Journal. I know this will come as a surprise to all of you, but they are reporting that vitamin D and fish oil reduce the risk of autoimmune disease. Um, Dr. Vastani has a PhD in microbiology and immunology, and he's authored over 200 scientific papers published in peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Vashtani is the co-owner of Immunosciences Lab in Los Angeles, which offers testing for various types of infections, including Lyme disease. He's the chief science officer for Cyrex Labs, for whom he's developed all their tests. He's also a professor in the Department of Preventative Medicine at Loma Linda University. Dr. Risto Vashtani, my friend Ari, thank you so much for honoring us with your presence tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. White, tonight, and, and thank you, all the participants. Uh, tonight, I'm going to speak about very, very important test, which from the bottom of my heart, I believe that every one of us should have this test once a year as part of our annual checkup. So I hope by end of the presentation, Dr. White, at least I will convince you, hopefully, that you'll decide to do this test on your own uh, blood. Oh, absolutely. I just, just got the test kits in yesterday. Okay, thank <laughs> I you. I can't wait to do it. Thank you. So uh, recently, very recently, about a month ago, 
I published this article in a journal called Pathophysiology uh, about the role of exposomes in autoimmune diseases. And this figure is taken from there. So what are exposomes? You'll see a little bit later on, but they are in general infections, dietary components, toxic chemicals, gut microbiome, um, and their effect on the immune system, which may result in autoimmune disease. For genes plus exposomes are responsible for many, many autoimmune diseases, but gene or genetics is only one third. The exposome or the environmental factors are the other two thirds. So we have to pay attention more to the environmental factors when we talk about inflammatory and autoimmune disorders. I like very much this article and look at the title of this article, which was published in Frontiers in Immunology about a year ago. Environmental exposure and autoimmune diseases, contribution of gut microbiome. That's exactly what was in those uh, in earlier slide. So they talk about this biosis of gut microbiome is another important environmental factor which can alter you know, our immune system, our barriers, our mucosal immune system that, ca that can result in autoimmunity. But you'll see I emphasize this sentence in blue. And that is the most challenging aspect of autoimmunity is to identify the early events that trigger immune dysregulation and autoimmunity. So environmental factors affect the immune system and the most sensitive biomarker based on my opinion is lymphocyte mapping. And that's what we are going to talk about tonight. In the same article, you see that they talk about environmental factors, silica, trichloroethylene, smoking, mercury, pesticides, pristine, and many other toxic chemicals, inducing <clears throat> reactive oxygen species, lipid peroxidation, <clears throat> ROS can affect, inhibit good gene, enhances bad genes, for example, DNA damage, and all of that will have a significant effect on the immune system because lipid peroxidation results in neoantigen formation. What is neoantigen, new antigen formation? Meaning some of these chemicals such as mercury bind to body components albumin, hemoglobin, smooth muscle, IgG, then results in autoantibody production. For example, rheumatoid factor is IgM produced against our own IgG. Furthermore, you see that these neoantigens affect the T cell. Tonight, we'll talk a lot about the balance between Treg versus Th1 and Th17. Tregs are the good guys regulating the immune system, and Th1 and Th17 are the autoreactive lymphocytes. When become overactivated by releasing all these inflammatory cytokines, can have significant effect on body composition in general. So this dysregulation in T cell, low Treg, high Th1 and Th17, causing cell-mediated immune overreaction, and then communication between the T cell with the B cells results in activation of the B cell, which the B cell then produces autoantibodies such as anti-nuclear antibodies, rheumatoid factor already mentioned, double-stranded DNA, 
smooth muscle antibody, mitochondrial antibody, and the final result is going to be autoimmune disease. I really love this article, which was published in Frontiers in Immunology, actually summarizing probably uh, my work of 25 years. So what what the exposome? Like, you blocked my earbud somehow. Yeah. So what are the exposomes? You can see in here, there are two parts of the, associated with expo, exposome. The external environment, which I talked about, but we have to include stress, lifestyle, indoor air pollution, outdoor air pollution, diet and additives. Please do not forget salt. This is an opportunity. Too much salt is activating T helper 17. And vitamin D down regulating TH17. So when you talk about, we have to take our vitamin D, please also think about reducing the amount of salt that you take. Medications, infections, xenobiotics. So those are external environmental factors. Now we have internal environmental factors, protein modification. We have more than 600 different proteins get modified internally for many, many reasons that we don't know about. Our gut flora plays a significant role in inflammation and autoimmunity. And then on this side, you have protein adducts and many other factors. So we have to pay attention to the exposome factors. This is a cover of one of my books that you see the immune system right here, the GI and the nervous system and direct communication between these three systems. And of course, if you ask the neurologist, we'll say this one is the most important one the nervous system, ask the GI. They will say, yes, the gastrointestinal is more important. I am as an immunologist, I'm going to fight with them and saying the immune system is more important because it's communicating both with GI and with the nervous system. So any abnormality anyway, in result of miscommunication between immune system, nervous system, and GI system may result in autoimmunity, which should be in the middle. So this is gut brain immune axis. So that will take us since I believe that the immune system is the most important one, let's classify the immune system very sim in a simple manner the mucosal immune system, which our first line of defense, our homeland security, mucous membrane, secretory IgA, SARS-CoV-2 should break down the mucous membrane before getting into the lungs. And secretory IgA is the most protective against SARS-CoV-2. The next humoral immunity, which is the antibodies, IgG, IgA, IgM, and of course, also in the case of allergies, we produce IgE. So uh, remember game, IgG, IgA, IgM, and IgE. Those are the antibodies. But tonight I'm going to talk mainly about cell-mediated immunity. T cells, B cells, NK cells, uh, cytokines I'm not going to talk about, but indirectly, yes, I will talk about. So in each one of these, these components of the immune system, we have both innate and adaptive. So in the case of innate immune response, three very important cells, dendritic cells, mast cells, and macrophages 
by taking up the foreign materials can protect the body against these pathogens. The, the adaptive immune response, also dendritic cells play a role, but by communicating with naive T cells, which are not being differentiated, they become Th1, Th2, Th3, which is Treg, Th17, some natural killer cells, and together protecting the body against all the enemies. So that was a little bit introduction about innate and adaptive immune response. So let's, let's put together the picture because unfortunately in the media or the media misled people about the immune system and how the immune system works. That's why I put the nervous the neuron in here. And you'll see why I put the neuron in here. So when we get exposed to a virus, such as Corona, the first line of defense as part of the innate immunity, the macrophages will take that up, internalizing it. And since the virus is very huge molecule, they have to break it down to smaller size called antigens, like nucleoprotein, spike protein. Then the nucleoprotein or spike protein and other proteins taken up by antigen presenting cells, presenting it to T helper cells. So up to here, we are talking about innate immune system. But here, these are components of adaptive immune response. They will release either Th1 cytokines such as interferon gamma and IL-2, activate some T cells to, be to become cytotoxic lymphocytes. And the job of cytotoxic lymphocyte is to go after the coronavirus or cells infected with coronavirus in order to protect the body against that infectious material. When cytotoxic lymphocytes finish the job, they are going to leave behind memory T cell and memory cytotoxic T cell. So if the, if the vaccine did not protect us, which we know that is a reality now, and we get for the second time, or this for the second time, the same virus get into our body, this memory cytotoxic memory cells and memory T cells immediately will go after the virus and try to stop the virus to infect even the macrophages. And, th and that's how the body become victorious against different pathogens. This part of cytotoxic lymphocyte is also part of innate immune system because unconditionally will go after pathogens and try to stop them from infecting our body. Now in the presence of Th2 cytokines, such as IL-4, IL-13 and others, becomes T helper cell, either Th1 or Th2, and then collaboration with B cells becomes plasma cells and plasma cells have the capacity to produce antibody IgG, IgA, IgM, and IgE antibodies. And this, in this particular case, the antibodies will recognize the coronavirus. 
However, after finishing the job of producing antibody, <laughs> in majority of the cases, this antibody may stay in the body for a year or two, six months, depends on the antigenicity or structure of the antigen, but that will leave behind short-term and long-term memory B cell. So when the next time the body will encounter, will have some encounter with the same virus, these B cells under normal condition take 14 days to be in place, but this time within a day or two, they will become activated, the long, especially the long-term memory cells will start making antibodies and antibodies will go after coronavirus. So altogether, the cytotoxic lymphocytes, T cell, memory T cell, memory cytotoxic T cells, and memory B cell protect the body not only against the viruses today, but against the viruses tomorrow and even next year and probably even in next 20 years. So please, based on this principle of the immune system, do not accept what they told us in the media that the memory lymphocyte will stay in the body only for one year or two. No, the memory lymphocytes are comparable to memory neurons. If I will see Ben on the street, because I have seen him before, right away I can recognize you, right? That's thanks to my memory cells in my brain. The same thing, our memory B cells, our memory T cells are going to recognize the virus, if we had an encounter with that virus six months ago, five years ago, 20 years ago. Now, what's the difference between the memory B cells and the memory T cells? Okay, each one of them have different function. The memory T cells, as you could see in here, that mainly they are memory cytotoxic lymphocytes. Their lineage is they have different receptor on their surface. Their job is different. The memory B cells job is when the antigens in the, is in the body, they will become plasma cells and will, they will produce antibodies. So T cells do not produce antibodies. The B cells are going to produce antibodies. So together, the T cell response plus B cell response in the form of antibody is going to protect the body against the pathogens. So this was the most important slide. That was the main reason I spent so much time on this. So let's move on. So the immune system is in people is as diverse as height, beauty, intelligence, and other human features. Our genomes, lifestyles, and exposome affects our immunotypes. Immunotype meaning the pattern of lymphocytes. And so therefore, we cannot treat every individual with specific disease with the same medication. So this is the message of lifestyle medicine and personalized medicine. So, Naive B cells, in the presence of different exposomes, they become Th1, T helper 1, T helper 2, T Rex cells, Th9, Th17. The combination of Th1 and Th17, Th22, combination of Th2 with TH22, and the last one is follicular T helper 9. As you can see, each one of these T cell subsets 
have different function. For example, Th1 is involved in pathogenic inflammation and autoimmunity. Th2 involved in allergies and hypersensitivities. T-Rexel, protection against pathogenic inflammation and autoimmunity, keeping the balance. Th9 is involved in allergic response. T helper 17, although it is protecting us against extra cellular pathogens, but when become overactivated, participate in inflammation and autoimmunity. And of course, when we have the hybrid cell, hybrid between Th1 and Th17, this is the most pathogenic lymphocyte. So because it does participate in pathogenic inflammation and autoimmunity, Th22 in skin, dermatitis, psoriasis, Th2, Th22, allergies, hypersensitivities, and Th9, high affinity autoantibody production. But there is a point I would like to make in here. Each one of these cells, as you can see, produce different cocktail of cytokines. In the past, I'm saying in the past, many individuals were classifying Th1 and Th2 based on the cytokine they produced. In fact, there are some practitioners still, they measure Th1 and Th2 cytokines and they tell you the patient is having Th1 imbalance or Th2 imbalance. And tonight I'm going to tell you that's wrong. Why? Because let's look at interferon gamma. You see in here, it's produced by Th1, right? Look at interferon gamma here, it's produced by Th9. So when you measure interferon gamma as a measure of Th1, how do you know it's produced by Th1 and not by Th9? IL-17 is produced by TH-17, but IL-17 also is produced by natural killer cells, NKT cells. So when you measure that as a measure of TH-17, how do you know that IL-17 is not produced by NKT cell? So in summary, I would like to tell you the best way is to stain and count each one of these cells directly and not to go after indirect biomarkers. And that's what exactly we do at Cyrex. So furthermore, did you know that in addition to lymphocytes that release cytokines, red blood cells produce cytokines? or release cytokines, or absorb cytokines, and then release them. Platelet release cytokines. So again, when you measure Th1 or Th2 cytokines, how do you know they are not produced by red blood cells, platelets, or other type of cells? So that's the question I'm putting in here. How are you sure the cytokine that is measured is produced by Th1, Th2, Th17, or Trec. We are not sure. So that's why we have to measure immunity by counting different lymphocytes directly, which we call this lymphocyte map or lymphocyte mapping. So why we have to measure immunity with lymphocyte map? Because immune system is essential to protect our body against infection. I already mentioned that. Cancer and other environmental factors. The exposome factors, intrinsic and extrinsic factor, have a significant effect on the immune system years before disease development, sometimes 20 years. That's the beauty of lymphocyte mapping. So these are some of the factors associated with effect on the immune system. 
And abnormalities of the immune system can lead to autoimmune disorders, allergic diseases, immune deficiencies, and many more that I will show you, even Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, and more. So quantitative and qualitative changes in the composition of lymphocyte subsets provide an opportunity for the, not only for early detection, but for prevention of many immune disorders that affect one out of three Americans. So here, the list of cells that I started measuring in 1989. When, you know, the, you know, the time which AIDS was discovered, and so therefore we were doing lots of flow cytometry, including T cell, B cell, CD4, CD8, and natural killer cell. That's all. But with the advancement in the field of immunology and availability of monoclonal antibodies specifically made against different cluster differentiations, now we can stain additional cells directly, such as Th1, Th2, Trex cells, Th17, and other type of natural killer cell. So we used to call this partial immunophenotyping, which was very limited. And today, this is what we are measuring. The upper part, what we used to do all, all the way up to 2010, and this is the addition that including Th1, Th2, the ratios, Trx cells, Th17, and the ratios that we are doing today which is, it is the major breakthrough. And by the way, this is done in many research laboratories, but Cyrex is, is the only clinical laboratory is doing the lymphocyte immunophenotyping, uh, including all of this, which we call it comprehensive immunophenotyping or the lymphocyte map. So let's go back to COVID profiling, deep immune profiling of COVID patients and talking about distinct immunotype with therapeutic implications. And Dr. Weitz, if I need to stop for 30 seconds after this message, you are more than welcome to interject something in here because okay. the message is extremely important because what they found that when they looked at several hundred of patients with COVID during hospitalization, they found one subgroup, they had hypo activation of the immune system, low white blood cell count, low lymphocyte, low CD4, low CD8, low TH17, low TH1, low TH, everything was low. Second group, hyper activation of the immune system. Everything was elevated. And you will see some examples. And the third group were comparable. They had COVID, but they were comparable to healthy people. Their immune system was comparable to healthy people. So the question I'm putting in here, and I had COVID, I was hospitalized for four days. So how come even until today, all patients with COVID are treated with the same cocktail of medication? Well, when uh, all you have is a hammer and we use the hammer for every, every uh, job you have, yeah, so we realize or we know, we appreciate that personalized treatment. And if you read this sentence right here, these immunotypes may have implications for design of therapeutics 
and vaccines for COVID-19. This was published more than a year ago. Now, now what about, um, we hear all the time, the real risk of severe COVID has to do with this cytokine storm that happens in the lungs. And so that's the reason I think for using the dexamethasone is that everybody with severe COVID has this cytokine storm, this extreme uh, inflammatory process that we're trying to uh, intervene in. I will have an answer for you. First of all, there are lots of articles and you'll see in my continuation of my presentation that the, the one with low white blood cell count, low lymphocyte, low CD4, low CD8, it it's, makes sense when you don't have enough soldiers to fight for you, then you, the body is not going to survive. The cytokine storm and other whatever factors produced by these few lymphocytes in our body. So the one who did not survive in the hospitals were the one who were suffering from hypo activation of the immune system, not hyperactivation of immune system, relatively, okay? So let's continue. So here example, this article I think published uh, very, very recently. But by the way, you're saying that patients had uh, low white blood cells prior to getting COVID, not that their white blood cells got low after getting COVID. They say at the time of hospitalization. So obviously they had probably low white blood cell counts and low lymphocytes before. Right. I believe so, yes. So here, example. And this, they, in this article, they found that the threshold for T cell was 400, CD for 200, and again, we used to say individual with less than 400 CD4 cell, they may have AIDS. Now they reduce that to 200. So this is the extreme. CD8 one less than 100, B cell less than one to 20, and I believe uh, that's also is less than 100. So conclusion, the results of this study suggest that evaluation of peripheral blood lymphocyte in COVID-19 patients could be valuable in the study of the immune responses to the disease and the prognostication of the outcome. So if you have a picture like this, the probability of surviving the virus is very low. But in individual with hyperactivation of the immune system, even you have cytokine storm, the probability of surviving the disease is much higher because you have so many soldiers that are fighting for you. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So this is my own blood, okay? So what are we looking, looking at? This is before COVID. White blood cell count, very nice. Total lymphocytes, beautiful. And B and T cell ratio, 5.6. CD4, CD8 ratio 2.7, and you'll see the normal ranges. TH1, TH2, 3.9, right in the middle. TH17, Treg, 1.5, again in the middle. And uh, NK cytotoxic, NK normal. I had few extra NK T cell, which I don't think in here caused any problem in my body. So these are the seven components that we use for interpretation of the test results. That's why I call them the magnificent seven to look at these for interpretation of results. So please remember, this is before COVID. Now, when I was in the hospital and few, when I released from the hospital, this is what I did. Look what happened. This is hyper activation of the immune system. The T cells were increased by 20, 30%. Helper cells were increased. Th1, Th2, Treg cells went down and NK T cell also went up significantly. So this is five months after because the test was not available. 
Okay? Then I repeated the test. Three months after that, look what happened. So almost everything, almost, went back to normal. So this is the beauty of lymphocyte immunophenotyping and classification to hypoactivation and hyperactivation of the immune system. So yes, Dr. White, I had cytokine store, hyperactivation of the immune system, but I did survive the disease because my soldiers knew how to fight because of my lifestyle, my normal lifestyle. And, and somebody who had low white blood cell count, if you give them um, uh, dexamethasone, um, that's gonna suppress your immune system even more. And, and that could be why those patients who don't respond don't do well with that treatment. That's the exact point I made. And I agree with you that imagine the person is having only 600 lymphocytes instead of having a couple thousands. You put them on dexamethasone. So even if those cells could produce some beneficial cytokines, they're not going to produce them anymore. You inhibit them. So that's why, unfortunately, those who died in hospitals, they were suffering from low number of soldiers. Okay, let's continue now. And, and what percentage of our population probably has low white blood cells, especially considering, you know, since the topic is autoimmunity, uh, how common uh, these drugs that suppress part of the immune system are that are often used to treat autoimmunity? Based on, you know, we have a roundtable discussion every other week by Cyrex. Another meaning, you order your own lymphocyte map. Then two weeks later, you can participate in this uh, roundtable discussion, and I'll put your test result without, of course, revealing your name, right? We'll discuss your patient's test results. Only based on what we got at Cyrex, I can attest that about 20 to 25% of those orders came through or Cyrex had very low lymphocyte count, T cell and B cells and helper and suppressor and so forth. Okay, so, so now let's go to methodology. Hang on one second. Somebody asked a question. Since your immune system was working so well, why did you end up being hospitalized? Why well, you are not asking if... Uh, 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 first of all, I really didn't know, I didn't, did, I really, it wasn't needed to go to the hospital. But, but always you have to listen to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> because the doctor told her that he has the beginning of pneumonia. On the basis of what? Uh, well, you know, but listening to my, you know. Okay. Lungs. And, and by the way, they put me on a medication, uh, remdesivir. It is proven that that remdesivir prolongs stay in the hospital. Or <laughs> prolonged patients stay in the hospital. So they're not using it anymore. It was published in several articles. So let's move on to methodology. The methodology is called flow cytometry. What is flow cytometry? The study of cells as they move in fluid suspension, allowing multiple measurements to be made per cell. Another meaning, we can count more than 20,000 cells in less than one minute. Imagine when I was in graduate school and the professor put me uh, behind the microscope to count 20,000 cells. How long would have taken? Probably a week. So now in a minute, with high reproducibility, can report the results. So what do we do? We take drop of blood, mixing it with mixture of monoclonal antibodies, which each one have different color. 
on each cell, we have different cluster differentiation, CD. Like T cell has cluster differentiation 23 or three. B cell has cluster differentiation 19 specifically. And the same thing for Th1, Th2, Th17, and Trx cells, okay? So the antibodies now, if they are red, that will bind only to cluster differentiation specific to that monoclonal antibody. So now, when this mixture of cells go through the sheath fluid, they get separated based on their color, red or green. And then when it goes into very narrow area, the laser will hit. The red cells will go to one direction and the green cells will go to another direction and will count 20,000 cells and will give us the percentage of T cell, B cell, T helper one, T helper two, T H17, regulator T cell, and natural killer cell. So this is the principle of the methodology. So again, you see that B cell has specific cluster differentiation, CD19 right here. You are not going to find that on CD4. You are not going to find that on CD8. On CD4 cell, okay? There is cluster differentiation four. You are not going to find that on B cell. You are not going to find that on CD8 cells. And the same thing, CD8, which is covered in this area, is going to be found on, on cytotoxic lymphocyte and not on other type of cells. Therefore, monoclonal antibody is going to stain specifically CD4, CD8, TH1, TH2, TS17 and more. So in less than one minute, the computer will count 20,000 cells and classify them based on their characteristics or their, or their CD marker on the surface of lymphocytes. So that's why measuring cytokines became obsolete after this, because we are directly staining the cells and we are counting the cells. So now let's look at some examples of patients with autoimmune disease. This is a patient with systemic lupus erythematosus. So please just be with me and let's look at up to CD4, CD8 ratio. What do you see? That was a test I used to do between 19, 89, to 2010, I would have reported everything normal for this patient, correct? But when you do measure, TH2 is low, TH17 is high. Then the ratio TH17 Treg is high, the NK cell is high, but overall this patient is TH 17 dominant, and therefore there are many nutritional factors, medications can decrease the number of TH17 and increase the number of regulatory T cell and return the immune system to complete balance and that will help patients with lupus erythematosus. And by the way, vitamin D is one of those. Can bring down the number of TH17 by increasing the number of regulatory T cell. Now, is she TH17 dominant because of lupus or is the TH17 dominant part of the causation of lupus? No one really can answer that question. I, based on my opinion, could be both, okay? Environmental factors can increase the number of TH17. 
years before systemic lupus erythematosus. But if you don't do anything about it, an individual who is TH17 dominant, most probably that person will end up five years, 10 years, 20 years later with full-blown lupus or other type of autoimmune disease. Do we, Ari, what do you say? What are you we, saying will bring down the TH17 more directly other than vitamin D bringing up the Treg? Please, please wait. I have okay. slides specifically for that. Terrific. Okay. Yeah, let's go. So the next item is patient with Lyme disease, multiple chemical sensitivity, repeated concussion, and Dr. Masnik very, is very familiar with those patients. Elevated 21 hydroxylase, meaning uh, uh, adrenal insufficiency, elevated parabens, toxic chemical exposure, reaction to many foods, like out of 180 measured by Cyrex, about 70 of them were abnormal. So highly reactive, anti-nuclear antibody, one to 80. So when we did this, guess what? Okay, first of all, you see that number of helper cells are elevated, 1,174. And relatively CD4, CD8 ratio is 3.9. The ideal for me is around two. Then T, helper one is increased and T helper 17. So this individual was classified as TH1 plus TH17 dominant. And this is an answer to your question, Dr. White. This individual doesn't have autoimmune disease, but is having exposure, Lyme disease, exposure to chemicals and uh, adrenal insufficiency, uh, chemical antibodies, food immune reaction. So this is a classical patient. If the doctor will not take care of this individual, down the road will develop full-blown autoimmune disease. Now, if you correct the Lyme disease and, and some of the toxins and, and food sensitivities, will the immune system go back into better balance? I have no doubt. I have no doubt, yes. But as we do more testing, we learn every day. So, so now that was relatively high CD4, CD8 ratio. So look at these patients you know, multiple chemical sensitivity. They react to everything. Look at the ratio of CD4, CD8, even is less than HIV and AIDS. We used to call this chemical induced immune deficiency syndrome. So unless you take care of chemical sensitivity, which is not easy, these patients react to everything perfume, name it, everything. So never CD4, CD8 ratio, ratio should be less than one. The best is two. As soon as goes higher than three, it goes towards autoimmunity. When it goes below than one, that goes through towards immunodeficiencies. So we have to take care of that. Now, this is the opposite case. Look at CD4, CD8 ratio of 5.6. This patient is having inflammation and autoimmunity. What kind? I don't know. That's what the doctor told us. But again, high CD4, relatively low CD8 resulted in a ratio of 5.6. I do see this in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, thyroiditis, multiple sclerosis, and many other disorders. <coughs> and then you see the patient also is 
having very high Th1. So it is also Th1 dominant. So the high number of T helper cells, actually most of them are Th1 and some of them also are Th2. So the patient is mainly Th1 dominant and therefore they have to take care of uh, the increasing probably the number of cytotoxic CD8 cells return the balance between CD4, CD8, and hopefully that will also result in correction in the number of Th1 and Th2 cells. Go to the next one. This individual, as you can see, had low IgG subclass two. EBV early antigen, this is not IgG antibody elevation. Early antigen meaning EBV became reactivated and B cells became activated to produce more antibodies. Whether mold exposure was part of that, I really don't know. But here we see combination of two different pathogens, molds and Epstein-Barr virus caused what? Significant elevation in Th1, this in Th17, this individual is classical Th17 dominant with elevation of natural killer cells because natural killer cells probably tried to fight the Epstein-Barr virus and maybe even the mold. So you see these abnormalities are found not only in patients with autoimmune disease, patients exposed to environmental triggers. So those were some of the cases. What is the clinical importance of comprehensive lymphocyte immunophenotyping? And as you can see in here, first of all, this is based on articles I read in scientific journals and this evidence uh, is in different journal articles in relation to different autoimmune diseases. For example, in thyroid autoimmunity, they found patients, most of them were Th1 dominant. When they treated them with anti-thyroid drugs, the number of Th1 went down, the number of Th2 went up, and therefore more balance between Th1 and Th2. And that shows that the treatment that the doctor gave to that patient was working for that specific patient. So this was patient with Graves, right? Yes. Okay. The same thing, I'm not really going to read this again. In rheumatoid arthritis, Th17 dominant, they claim that methotrexate, brought down the number of TH17. And there are some publications in scientific journals that I read about, and this is one of them. I read more. Multiple sclerosis, TH1 and TH17 dominant. Why? Because these are, remember the hybrid cells. These cells under inflammatory condition have the capacity to break down the blood brain barriers and get into the brain area, cause inflammation in the brain, resulting in neuronal cell death that result in multiple sclerosis and in some cases, even in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So when they put them on medication, they could bring down the number of Th1 and Th17. And the patient did not have relapse for a long period of time. The same story about scleroderma. And lupus, mainly Th17 and also Th1 and Th2. After treatment, they saw significant improvement in the patient's condition by doing the lymphocyte immuno phenotyping. Psoriasis also, when they were treated with anti-IL-17, you know, that's a new medication. 
that they block production of IL-17 by so-called TS-17, but other cells also producing IL-17, they could see significant improvement in inflammatory condition in patients with psoriasis. In relation to COVID already talked about that those who had low lymphocyte and T cell subsets relatively did not survive the disease. And many of them passed away in the hospital, unfortunately. So this is the proof of concept that lymphocyte immunophenotyping and treatment where if works, we can see that by follow-up uh, uh, testing with uh, lymphocyte immunophenotyping. So now I'm going to share with you a few flowers, okay? So you see the lymphocyte. I said that 25% that tests that come to Cyrex, they have low lymphocytes. How can we increase that? All of these are in here but none of them can get close to this and this. Exercise and good nutrition. At least three or four articles published in Science or Nature that show that exercise, increasing production of growth factors that enhancing production of different lymphocytes and of course, good nutrition. And therefore, I'm not going to read all of this, okay? Because we don't have time to go through each one of these. Next, B cells. We have only few items, but definitely probiotics and specifically lactobacillus KCI, the GG, this one. So you see lactobacillus, lactobacillus, DHA, fish oil, beta-glucan, curcumin. So all these can increase the number of B cells, which is very important. Next, CD4 cells, IVIG, vitamin D, again, fish oil, and many others. CD8 cells, unfortunately, we have only few. And uh, BCG vaccination is one of them. And by the way, BCG vaccination also is protective against COVID because BCG shares homology with SARS-CoV-2. Peanut agglutinin, it's only one publication. And again, vitamin D. So vitamin D is really the most important molecule, DHEA, five milligram per day. Look at TH1, monoclonal antibodies, they are medications, corticosteroids, you have dexamethasone and metformin. The rest are fish oil, zinc, vitamin D, green tea, fish oil again, resolvins, polyphenols, curcumin, bromelain are instrumental in bringing down the activity of TH1. TH2, you see sometimes the same item may be in both. Why? Because sometimes the issue is immune regulation. They regulate the immune system and therefore back to balance. So these are, again, you'll see vitamin E, probiotic, zinc, fish oil, uh, and uh, many others. T-Rex cell is one of the most important one that you should take care of in a patient with autoimmunity. So here, IVIG, azithromycin. It is br um, bringing down the number of, or enhancing, enhancing the activity of T-Rex cells. Chloroquine if I'm allowed to mention the name. Also increasing the activity of T-Rex cell. Dexamethasone, and of course, indole-3-carbinol, 
short chain fatty acid, L arginine, DHA, astragalus, quercetin, berberine, uh, curcumin, lactoferrin. You'll see that all these factors can regulate the T-Rex cells and bring down or back to balance TH1 and TH2 imbalance. TH17, again, chloroquine, IVIG, dexamethasone, metformin, and the other factors. But again, remember, sodium chloride is increasing, not decreasing, the number of TH17 and increasing their activities also to produce more IL-17. So now you saw vitamin D almost ev was everywhere, everywhere, correct? So now I would like to share with you the article that I read yesterday in Nature Immunology. Role of the T cell vitamin D receptor in severe COVID-19. And they showed that giving vitamin D can bring down the activity of TH1 and increasing the T-Rex cells, bringing down TH1 and TH17. And so therefore should be recommended for patients with COVID-19. And this is the cover of nature immunology. So bear with me for a few seconds. So CYP24A1 is a gene that provides instructions for making an enzyme called 21 hydroxylase, the blue. This is the enzyme. This is the vitamin D, correct? So this enzyme help to convert vitamin D to dihydroxylated vitamin D. And dihydroxylated vitamin D get into the nucleus and downregulate TH1 and TH17. And that's in the next slide, okay? So in individual with vitamin insufficiency, T cell become overactivated and they do suffer from inflammation. And if we do, not, we do not correct that, we'll end up with, individual may end up with autoimmune disease. So because they produce lots of IL-17 because TH17, IL-22, interferon gamma, but they produce less IL-6 and IL-10, which IL-10 is regulatory cytokines. Now we give vitamin D to these patients and they become vitamin D sufficient. So vitamin D sufficient, they produce less, the cells. Somebody asked- Less it... IL-17, they produce less IL-22, they will produce less interferon gamma, but will produce more IL-6 and IL-10. And these cells, in the presence of vitamin D can resolve inflammation. This is the message of this article from Nature Immunology. Do you, did you have any question? Yeah, one of the questions is, it's common in the functional medicine world that we typically prescribe vitamin D with vitamin K2. In this context, is that also important? I personally take vitamin D with vitamin K. And uh, they did not mention in this article, but other articles uh, discuss the importance of addition of vitamin K to vitamin D. Thank you for asking that. Okay. So that is very well accepted. Also, um, are you going to be, are you able to share your slides with us? And if not, can we get a list of these? you know, nutrients that work with these different uh, factors? Okay, I can provide you with a list of references. Okay. That, by the way, for each one of these, I have between two to five, sometimes 10 different articles. For example, resveratrol. 
I can name 10 different articles that can activate natural killer cells. For example, for some, I have one or two. Some, I have five. Some, I have 10. So I can share with you definitely the references. It's better that way. Because okay. I don't want, you know, because I'm not promoting any product in here. Right. So, but references, definitely you can share with the audience. Tomorrow morning, that will be the first thing I'll do for you. Great. So Thank natural you. killer cells. Again, I did work with vitamin C, 500 milligram to 1,000 is the most ideal, but there are others, including ashwagandha, me medicinal mushrooms, astragalus, all of them can increase the activity of natural killer cells. So now in the last few slides, I really would like to bring your attention to this fascinating article Z, published in Journal of Immunology. It was so important that the editor in chief wrote um, some kind of review article about all of this. So they emphasizing the importance of microbiome Remember in my second slide, environmental factors plus the gut microbiota, the bad microbiome, microbiome may contribute to autoimmune disease. But here they emphasize the importance of good microbiota and uh, recommending very strongly to use prebiotic and probiotics. Why? The mechanism is right here. Let's look at why you have to have one apple a day. So you see the picture of the apple, right? It has lots of inulin. Inulin makes the good microbiome to produce short chain fatty acids such as butyrate. And that beauty rate activate T-Rex cell and inhibiting the inflammatory cells. This is one example. Liver, cholic acid, gut microbiome can change that to deoxycholic acid. Again, deoxycholic acid, activate T-Rex cell and inhibit, and also, first of all, inhibits macrophages, but improves or enhances gut barrier function, which is the root cause of many autoimmune diseases. That's why detoxification is so important. And again, the reference is right there. This is in Journal of Immunology about three months ago. The third one is the tryptophan that they took it out of the market years ago, unfortunately. But food containing tryptophan is metabolized by the gut microbiome, production of indole and indole derivatives by the gut microbiome, and again, inhibits like TH17, but enhancing the gut barrier function. So therefore, the importance of probiotics, prebiotics, vitamin D, and other nutritional supplements for patients who may have abnormal lymphocyte map. So let's conclude that what disorders so far, based on the articles that I read in scientific journals, could be associated with abnormal lymphocyte map. Multiple chemical sensitivity, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, cancers, asthma, allergy, hypersensitivity, variety of autoimmune diseases, all the way to here, psoriasis, phospholipid syndrome, diabetes, uh, multiple system atrophy, uveitis, heart disease, including cardiomyopathy, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, 
And also, we, I have read this article about recurrent pregnancy loss, especially when they have too many natural killer cells, especially NKT cell. And then also COPD and of course, COVID and other infections. So uh, uh, the last two slides, in conclusion, I would like to summarize again, why it's so important to measure immunity with lymphocyte map? Because the immune system is our homeland security, it is our policeman or police department, it is our uh, army that protecting us against many environmental factors. And these are the environmental factors and uh, abnormalities of the immune system down the road can lead to immune disorders, autoimmunities and immune deficiencies and quantitative and qualitative changes in the composition of lymphocyte subsets provide an opportunity for the early detection and prevention of many immune disorders that affect one out of three Americans. And finally, I would like to emphasize the importance of personalized immunity for personalized medicine. So it is important to look at lymphocyte map and based on abnormalities in lymphocyte map to provide the patient with personalized medicine, hopefully that personalized medicine will take care of abnormalities of uh, uh, their lymphocyte map. And so finally, finally, I would like to emphasize that and go back to that slide from science that individual with hypo activation of the immune system should be treated differently than the one with hyperactivation of the immune system. And with the one, even they don't have any uh, abnormalities uh, of the immune system. And with that, thank you so much. And I'm ready to answer any question if you have. So that, that was excellent, Dr. Vashtani. So my, my first question is when we, let's say a patient comes into the office and they already have autoimmune disease. Let's say they have rheumatoid arthritis or some other autoimmune disease. And we know that we have toxins and food sensitivities and infections that can trigger autoimmunity. And now we know that these um, immune imbalances can be factors. If we were going to uh, decide what to do first, would it make sense to address food sensitivities, infections, toxins, or would we want to try to uh, balance the immune system first. What what would what would you think a, a, a reasonable clinician yes. should do? I will answer your question a little bit differently, but I will answer also that specifically. Uh, a patient is coming to you for the first time. Where do you start? And that's the question. Uh, some start with array two, which they do uh, measure the integrity of gut barriers. Some start with the lymphocyte map, but I will start with lymphocyte map and looking at the barriers because the barriers plus lymphocyte map can guide me to the environmental triggers which causes some of these abnormalities. In one person could be food, in one person could be toxic chemicals, in another person could be pathogen, and in some could be all the above. So that's how I will start. Um, so somebody asked, if we're treating their immune imbalance based on lymphocyte map, are we treating the root cause or are we treating uh, a downstream effect of say food sensitivities or toxins? Uh, you are not treating the root cause, unfortunately. You are treating you are treating the results. Hopefully, after lymphocyte map, also you will get to the root cause of the problem. Because let's take example. Um, 
your patient is reacting to lectins and agglutinins. They could not or they cannot digest lectins and agglutinins, especially wheat germ agglutinin and phytohemagglutinin, which is produced by beans, kidney beans, for example. If they don't digest that and they make antibodies against these agglutinins, those antibodies cross-react with thyroid peroxidase and causing thyroid autoimmunity. Unless you remove that food from the diet of the patient until the gut barriers are repaired, until you provide digestive enzymes to that patient, make sure that undigested molecules, in this case, lectins and agglutinins will not get into the blood of the patient. Mm -hmm. And patient will not make antibody against that. Regardless how much the patient's TH1 and TH17 is abnormal, if you don't take care of the root cause, still six months later, uh, some of these uh, uh, may go back to uh, square one where we started. Dr. Vojani, how often do you find that people test positive to um, antibodies to lectins, to, to more than one lectin? I would say about 20% of the cases. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Now, now Dr. Vajstani, what do you think could be the best marker for if, let's say, we're treating a patient with autoimmune disease and, um, and from a functional medicine approach, we're trying to get to the root cause. You know, let's say they get whatever treatment they need, maybe for symptoms, but we're trying to get to the root cause. What is the best marker that we're treating the underlying autoimmunity? Is, is it, can we expect autoimmune um, um, antibodies to go down? Can we expect the lymphocyte map test to improve? Is there, what, what do you think is the best way for us to know, show objective progress, not just say on the fact that their thyroid is, you know, their, their, you know, their TSH is normal, but that we're getting to the underlying um, autoimmune process. I have no doubts that we have to look at both the antibodies and also lymphocyte map. Because in many autoimmune diseases, both antibodies and cell-mediated immunity play a significant role. So you have to look at antibodies and you have to look at lymphocyte map in order to find whether or not uh, your treatment made a difference in the life of your patient. So do we have good data that say, for example, antibodies going down correlates with the, uh, say, less likelihood of destruction of their thyroid on a long-term basis? I think there are lots of articles in the literature and also in relation to lymphocyte map I showed three or four slides towards the end of my talk. Okay, great. So both those could be measures yes. of- Yes, yes, yes. Great. Okay, any other questions? Um, how often should we retest for this patient's evaluation with a lymphocyte map, say? You can learn from my uh, test after COVID uh, between three to six months. Because cell-mediated immunity, for example, if you have abnormal TH17, is not going to change overnight. The same thing for TH1 and others. They are not going to change overnight. Um, when you make intervention, wait, please, at least three months, but uh, even I will recommend six months. And then repeat the test. Dr. Vojani, uh, when you're talking about cholic acid, I mean, you're basically talking about bile acids. Is that correct? And then yes, correct. So it sounds like it's important for us to make sure that our patients' bodies are producing 
bile acids adequately. Yes. Yes, correct. Thank you for mentioning that. Okay. Okay, great. We're going to wrap it there unless there's any final questions. Um, that was a fantastic presentation, Dr. Vrishtani. Thank My you pleasure. so much for the information. Tomorrow I, you, tomorrow I will send you the references. That's great. I can't wait to take my lymphocyte map test. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next month. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way more people will be able to find this Rational Wellness Podcast when they're searching for health podcasts. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do now have a few openings for new nutritional consultations for patients um, at my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Clinic. So if you're interested, please call my office, 310-395-3111 and sign up for one of the few remaining slots for a comprehensive nutritional consultation with Dr. Ben Weitz. Thank you and see you next week.